Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 302 for Wednesday, Cinco de Mayo, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. Rainy Durham, New Hampshire. Today, I'm Dave Hamilton. Hey, here in sunny central coast of California, Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Rub it in, won't you? Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's nothing like that warm California sun, huh? Well, it's funny because uh, where I used to live is actually 90 degrees today, and it's oh. just a nice 70 degrees here today. So I'm actually keeping a very close track of... The weather trade-offs that I made. I like that hot weather. Oh, interesting. I yeah, okay. I wasn't sure if like because seventy or ninety, neither is terrible. But but some people like you know we each prefer kind of a different you know a different thing at different times. So yeah, that's, yeah, it's good. Hey, um, speaking of warm weather, I had the opportunity to play not one but two outdoor gigs this past weekend. I played with Bitter Pill on Saturday at a uh, it was a, a private ish. Uh, private, but you know, guests and friends were were welcome. Uh, party on a on this woman's farm, on this family's farm, I should say, and uh, and then Saturday, Sunday, played an afternoon gig with Monkey Fist uh, at that football field that we've played at a few times over the yeah. uh, during the pandemic. And man, it was it was so nice. So for the bitter pill gig, like Monkey Fist, for both gigs, we brought our own PA. And so just going through the motions of loading all the gear, setting everything up, kind of, you know, building a, a stage from scratch, if you will, uh, you know, and, and kind of setting up the back line and setting up the front line and getting it all going and wiring it up and ringing out the monitors, which outside is sort of a, you know, it's, it's a perfunctory event. But, uh, oh. but you know, go like just going through all of that was excellent. Now, with bitter pill, I are for our gigs this summer that are that are able to be full band, and not all of them will be. Uh, so, like there'll be some. Actually, I think there'll be one or two that I don't play, but they'll, then there'll be some that are more acoustic, where I'm just bringing my my pitch slab. But um, but for for the the gigs where I'm bringing you know a full drum set, I'm also bringing my pitch slab. So that plus PA gear plus my my drums, my car was like full to the brim. And it was kind of awesome to, you know, to have to pack all that stuff. Now, you know, there's days where that won't feel quite as awesome, but, um, right, right now it's new again, right? But right now it was, well, yeah, it was just like, okay. Like, and going through the list and just like checking it out. I spent about an hour. It's the first time we've done bitter pill gigs this way where we're running our own sound. The, the, the prior gigs that I had played with them had all been at places where there was like, you know, sound, but this was a farm and a field with nothing. I mean, I literally played in the grass and, uh, and so I, I spent about an hour ahead of time the day before going through the mixer and kind of building the, you know, the channels and everything so that we didn't have to do that on the fly there. But it was really kind of nice. It was like, oh, I remember how to do this. It's been so long. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but it was great. And the crowds for both gigs were great. We um, the band. So played. tell me about the football one. So the, the one yeah. on the football field. Yeah. You are about 20 yards from where a bunch of round tables begin to start. Uh, no tables. We are we are at. We are pat just past the end zone of this football field. There's a there's a hill that goes up maybe I'd say ten feet up, and then there's a a huge stage. It's a it's a permanent fixture. They do a lot of um, like youth theater productions outside there. So we're looking at the uh, at the goalpost essentially, not essentially. We are looking at the okay. goalpost, and on the other side of the the goalpost is where people start to set up their you know their blankets and chairs and tables and things like that. And, uh, and is, is some kind of forced social distancing happening? Um, it's encouraged. It's suggested. It's it's requested, I'll say. And and people do it because it's a football field. Like there's literally plenty of room. But, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you've seen a football field before. Yeah. We, don't, we don't draw those kinds of crowds, Paul. So, um, so yeah, people were able to kind of keep their distance and, and all of that stuff. And uh, no, it doesn't it. It has never been a problem. And it wasn't a problem uh, this last one either. Uh, but you know, the people are close enough where they can yell out requests and we can really interact. And I think that was, that was the thing that, that I really appreciated about both of these gigs was, you know, being able to, 
just like have a, a crowd that, that was engaged and interactive and they were just as happy to be there as we were, you know, and uh, I missed that. I missed entertaining um, and, and engaging. Yeah. 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 It was good. Now I got to the bitter pill gig and um, you know, we started playing now Saturday after Sunday afternoon, the weather was truly fantastic. It was like 72, maybe kind of like what you're having today. Sunny. We had a brief little rainstorm, like right when we arrived at the thing, but uh, it was very, very sort of sprinkly. And that was it. So that, that all worked out. That was perfect. Saturday was a little cooler. It was maybe 55, uh, maybe, maybe a little warmer, but not quite 60. Uh, but the sun was out and it was great. But I, you know, we got everything set up, obviously, as I said, and, and then we started to play and I'm like, Oh yeah, my foot hurts a little bit. Like, Oh, you know, I'm playing barefoot on cold pedals. Like, okay, it must just be the cold. Like didn't really think anything of it. And then I sort of stopped thinking about it, but then, you know, maybe three songs before the end of the gig. I'm like, gosh, my foot still hurts. Wait a minute. I whacked the crap out of my toe before <laughs> I went to bed last night. And uh, I looked down in my, 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 my second smallest toe on my right was foot. on pointed my pointed in the wrong foot. direction. No, it wasn't. That was, it wasn't pointed in the wrong direction, but it was like purple and, and big, you know? And I was like, Oh, and so I turned to Mike, our, our um, banjo player in the middle of like in between two songs or whatever. And I'm like, Hey man, I think I broke my toe. And he, sort of, he sort of laughed and he's like, well, sounds good. You know? And, uh, but uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure if I broke it or if I just bruised it. it I haven't had it x-rayed. Um, it's, it is aimed straight. So I'm not terribly worried about, um, you know, getting it re-aimed. I did, I did break my toe once Paul and, um, it was, we were down in Florida. I was like running on the beach with the kids and there were these tiny little stumps and I oh. whacked right. Oh. Yes. Yep. I'm, I'm cringing just hearing the story. So I looked down after I whacked it, I had to like catch my son and throw him in the water. So I did that because obviously you got to take care of business. And then I look down at my toe and I see that it's bent like 90 degrees. And I honestly, in the moment thought it was just dislocated and I thought, okay. And my daughter was right there with me. And I'm like, oh, this is dislocated. I got to pop it back into place before all the inflammation sets in and I can't move it anymore. You know? So I just reached down, I popped it back into place and everything was good. And about two weeks later, I was walking up the stairs here to the studio. I'm like, you know, that toe still hurts. Hmm. So I went and had an x-ray and the doctor comes back and I was like, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, it's uh yeah, so it was broken, but whoever said it did a great job. And that was sort of the moment where I maybe checked out a little bit because it was like, wait, I was touching my own broken bones. Like, this is not okay. But, um, but it all worked out, you know? So I don't recommend breaking a toe, but if you do, there's not a whole lot you can do about it, but you yeah. Know. Yeah. So I, and I played the next, the next day the monkey fist gig, which is a standing gig, uh, where, uh, you know, obviously I did it on the toe, but it was, it's fine. You know, you kind of get into the zone. You don't really think about pain and it's all good, but, uh, it was good. I, I have these two pitch slaps, Paul is the one that I've had for a long time, which they call their, their table dance, which really when mic'd up sounds like a drum set, it's got like a good deep kick drum sound, a great little snare sound, kind of a little, you know, wooden Tommy kind of sound to it. And that's what I use for all these gigs. And then Lisa had gotten me a, um, uh, another one, a different one, they call it the spank box. And I had, and it's smaller, so it's higher pitched and it's not quite the same. And I had not found a good time to use it. I, I brought it to some like jam sessions and things like that, but it just wasn't my go-to. But I realized for these bitter pill gigs, especially where I'm playing kit and pitch slap sort of back and forth to have something that doesn't sound like a drum set was perfect. So now I've got these two things and I'm, I'm pretty stoked. So, you know fun with gear it's fun to take gear. it's fun to have a piece of gear that that you suddenly find a like a use for at least it was for me so oh, I was, absolutely i was stoked about that yeah very cool but we had well we had a moment that i wanted to share with you um the uh it was on stage and and these kinds of things happen all the time where uh, and and it it feeds this this sort of message that that I'm not the first person to say this. Uh, in fact, it, it's Scott Adams, the the guy who who writes all the Dilbert comics, um, had had said this in one of his business books years and years ago. He said, you know, when I learn to use my ego as a tool, 
as opposed to it being a liability, he's like, things got so much easier for me. And, and what he meant by that was, you know, turning it on and off. There's times when, you know, your ego is absolutely important and there's times when it can like crush you, it, you know, cause it can, it can cause you to do, you know, like self-defeating things. And, and there was a moment in the bitter pill gig where I sort of watched this happen. And it was a perfect example of the, of, of exactly that, like using it as a tool because there uh, was Billy like talking to the crowd and, you know, you, I mean, when you're, when you're performing like that, you need some level, you need confidence and, and generally, you know, you sort of equate that to ego. And, uh, and so, you know, he's there doing his confident thing and it's all good and everybody's happy. And then he kind of turned, you know, then like, you know, a split second later, he, uh, like we're in a, in the middle of a song, maybe it wasn't a split second, but you know, a minute later or something, we're in the middle of a song and, and he realizes, oh, it's, yeah, I think it, he's like, oh, it's too fast. And so he turns to me and, and like, we have this, this thing, you know, moment where it's like, oh, he's like, I think we need to pull it down. It's like, yeah, but it was like two different personalities, right? It's like, here's the performer, you know, person engaging the crowd appropriately. And then it was like, here's the person engaging, you know, with, with collaborating with his bandmates and uh, appropriately. And it was just like, yeah, that's how, that's how, that's a great example of that leverage your ego, turning it on and off, you know, not because he, he wasn't like barking at any of us or anything. He was like, I think it needs to be slower. And I was like, yep. Okay, great. No problem. You know, pull it down. Everybody works together. And, um, I, I feel like in, in band situations, you know, there's those people, they, they used to call it, at least where I was, where I grew up, they called it DLR syndrome, the David Lee Roth syndrome, where it was the ego couldn't ever turn off. It was just on all the time. Uh, and that can cause some problems as it, as it did for David, but it also served him well. Right. So, but if he, well, if that's he, the thing, if he could learn how to manage it. Yeah. Well, you know, this is the thing we, we often talk about. Uh, in this world of playing music, the one thing that seems to be a constant is truth. And if someone is true to who they are, you excuse a lot of things in general. So if someone is good and they have an ego and they know that they're good and they can deliver the goods whenever they do that, you might give a little bit more room. Again, you'd love it to be more of kind of a lovable thing and, and you know, that, that someone... Uh, was a little bit uh, self-effacing in in the sure. way, that they, but but some people like you know David Lee Roth that that built-in narcissist stuff um, is a useful tool. I mean, but, if it's, you just but he doesn't willing. use it as a tool, right? Like that's the problem. Is he? It wasn't just a tool. It was the only mode, right? I I, I get it. it, but like you said, in in certain situations, him applying that mode yes. was useful. You know, returned, returned a result. And I, I guess that's the thing. And, you know, the, the degree that some people are self-aware or not self-aware. Um, I was having this exact conversation with someone in my musical community recently. Uh, this person is, is without a doubt to me, the most professional ready, you know, she's been a professional in, in different ways over time. We were just talking about ego and, and we were saying, you know, and I think this is salient to a lot of people listening to the show for a lot of us who are kind of those weekend warrior, semi-professional type things, we're just trying to express ourselves, have the money come in, you know, do what's inside of us and get it out of us. We've had successes or not successes in the past or, you know, w whatever it may be. Right. But right here at this point in time, someone who beats their chest and says, you know, I'm the best guitar player in town you pretty much, get a, you know, you get a, you get a, like good, good for you. Have at it. Right. Like, like what's that got you if you're here at this stage of life now, now again, people coming up, you know, if you are an original band and you know, you need to make your mark in the world, confidence is certainly a tool. Yep. Um, how you use ego is a thing, you know? And I would say by the time you're in your twenties, you should have a sense as to whether your ego is getting you things or, or keeping you from things, right? Like, like there's a difference between I having like an, un yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a difference between having an unwavering, unwavering confidence in your abilities and bravado, you know? Right. And so, right. But there's, you should, there's, you should a, there's a place for both, it, but, yep. but not all places. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So my point is, is that, you know, amongst my group of friends, there are some that have had their taste of fame and, you know, done some pretty cool things. There's certainly many journeymen. There's certain people that have just been churning it out and, you know, having a, you know, a, a 
tangential career as a musician for many, many years. But really, at this point in time, I'm not exactly sure. And, th- you know, this one person who I'm thinking of who who has used ego ineffectively mm. for a long time, like, he has a reputation of being hard to play with. Like, you have to really decide. He's a, he's a fine player, but not necessarily... Not not the only player in town for what that what you need for most gigs around here, and you really have to decide if you want that whole package. Do you want a, you know a a a good, better than good player, but some baggage, or do you want a solid player who you can you know get the job done with? Yeah, and I think you know for a lot of bands that are you know in, in the, the type of people you play with, type of people I play with, there's choices, right? You know, and I'm not exactly sure. You know that guy with the lovable ego has figured out how to how to how you, people react to his how ego. How to use right? it you know? as a tool. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He has, he has taken life's messages and he has taken in he's taken in the me, the the meaning of how people have reacted to him and figured out you know when to stick your chest out, when to show some hubris yeah. and humility, and and I and I think that's a, a a really useful thing. It is, yeah, for sure. But, it was like um. We had David Jameson on a couple of weeks ago when he said, um, uh, how did he say? Oh, when he was going to go on the road with, I think, the security project. And all the guys were like, oh, okay, but like this dude's never been on the, like, yeah, he can play, but how are you going to be on the road? And they started Mm kind of grilling him about that because they knew he hadn't been on the road before. And the road is a very different thing. And A, You got to not be a jerk most of the time because you got to live with each other, you know, in much closer quarters and much greater frequency that you're seeing each other than you would playing gigs every couple of weeks. (laughs) Like it's fair. I can tolerate a lot of people if all I'm doing is seeing them at a gig. But if then I got to go back to the bus with you and spend all day tomorrow and all the next month with you every day, I'll either I'll either kill myself or I'll kill you or you. And and, <laughs> yeah. and I mean, even like when I was on the road with the clam bake. Well, first of all, I was in, I was not perfect about this, you, you you know, and that's that probably won't come as a surprise to people that know me. But, you know, I wasn't necessarily the easiest one to live with. But uh, but that was true of all of us. You know, we were we were like they were they were more seasoned. At, most of them were more seasoned at the road than I was because that was certainly my first tour. But um, but, it, you know, I learned a lot. It was like, oh, yeah, OK, you just got it. Like sometimes you just got to let it go. You know, <laughs> like, like it, it, it pick your battles. Do you really want to get involved in this or is it better to just kind of like grab your book and go sit over there and let it happen? Whatever it is, you know, yeah. is it important? And and really the guys that. Just sort of like they get on the bus and it's like, okay, now I'm just going to be like, I'm going to turn it off. That's an important thing for survival on the road. And, and it's an important thing for survival in a lot of places. So it's, you know, you, yeah, yeah. But I thought that was interesting when he brought that up when they were like, okay, yeah, but uh, what are you going to be like when we get out there? Are you going to freak out at all this stuff? Cause if so, that's not going to work. And I, and you see that, right? Like, when when touring musicians uh, or touring bands need to pick up a, a musician or whatever to take on the road, you know, to fill in some some piece that they that they don't have or whatever, they always want somebody that's been on the road before. You know, they're not knocking on doors of like people in cover bands saying, hey, man, you know, do, do you have like a day job? Because if not, you should come with us. Like, no, yeah. that like there there's two different camps there. And until you've proven that you can be in that other camp, the phone doesn't ring nearly as much. You gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta make your way in there. And, and that's the reason for it. Cause it's a whole different thing. It's it, which is yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was interesting when he brought that up. What do you got today, man? Um, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, the value of uniqueness and diversity in your scene. So, I personally am mostly energized when the circle of my music scene offers distinct and unique things to the world. So, for example, um, I played in a trio that kind of had a a harmony trio that kind of had its own... um, repertoire of unique three-part harmony things sure that was a that was a unique thing um my buddy simon in the house rockers 
he uh, started out during the pandemic doing solo stuff, and he was really specializing in acoustic remakes of 80s material, kind of almost exclusively. Nice. Really cool, like, you know, stuff that, you know, no one else was playing. I think that that's a good thing. When there's crossover or too much crossover, I just don't think it serves anything, right? Like, you know, there's plenty of songs out there. Mm-hmm. And no, nobody, nobody, we're doing covers, so nobody owns these songs, right? So, you, you know, you can't be too sure. handed. I'm stating a position that I think it's kind of cool, and it certainly makes everything copacetic when everybody's got a different thing, right? So, you know, in my singer-songwriter stuff, I do a lot of Bruce and a lot of Petty and a lot of singer-songwriter, like James Taylor and Cat Stevens, that type of stuff. That's kind of what my acoustic shows are. That's kind of what my niche is. And, you know, I have certain songs that are the ones that get requested when I play that, you know, people have kind of kind of come and know. I just think it makes for a more robust scene. Now, this is obviously is counter to the argument you know, that we've been having about, you know, if a band is playing and someone requests Brown Eyed Girl or Mustang Sally or, or Sweet Home Alabama, you play it because you got to give the people what they want. There, you know, two things can be true at the same time, right? You know, like sure. the value of a scene that where musicians are getting energized by other musicians and going out and developing a unique show. You don't need two of the same shows. It just, you know, and it actually, it makes it somewhat harder to refer something because if someone's doing the same thing that you're doing, you know, do you want to, do you want to refer to someone that's exactly like you or do you want to refer someone who has their own thing that, you know, I guess what I'm saying, Dave, is I value originality tremendously. I think that's what makes a local scene gel that there's, you know, different people who are known for doing different things. It makes it more interesting for the patrons of live music. It makes it more energizing for the, um, for the musicians, you know, you hear you know someone really good at what they do. You go back and look at what you do and say, I got to really, you know, dig in up my game. Yeah. And up my game in, in what I do. And that difference is cool because in any given night, if you and, you know, five, six, seven, ten other people are playing, give people a choice of, you know, the type of thing that they want and, 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 you know, be good at what you do, but be, be unique in what you do. I value, I value originality. So, I, I mean, the obvious answer to this is uh, if you and, and and don't take this the wrong way, but if you want to be unique, play and you want to be original, play original songs. Right. Because that that way you are controlling that. And sure. I, and and that is I mean, that really is the answer here. Now, it, it, that is easier said than done because, you know, original songs comes with an asterisk. They, they need to be good original songs like that people want to hear. Uh, it's even better if your original songs are the kinds of things that by the final chorus, everybody's sort of singing along or at least humming along and, and they're catchy, right? But not every band, not everybody's music needs to be catchy, but that can help in those moments, right? Where, you know, you've kind of got a thing, but, but yeah, it, in order to do that, original music is sort of the easy answer, um, except that it's not easy, uh, that's, and most scenes that, aren't demanding 20 different original music venues, right? Like, like your scenes are not, I, I mean, that, really, that's true. Yeah. That's true. It, like, I mean, certainly when I was coming up, uh, original, th- there were so few cover bands. I mean, they would play weddings. Like you were either in a wedding band or you were in an original band. There was mm-hmm. no, like, I'm just going to like go see a classic rock band. There were a few of those, but they were like wedding bands that would occasionally play a club and be like, oh, that's right. cool. Right. It was like the, the cover bands that, that you would see were actually unique in that it was rare to have like a room filled with the cover band. It was like, oh no, well you go see that original band and, and they're going to fill the house right. with their fans. And, and so like the scenes, Scenes change, um, but here, like around here, I would say original music is in many ways, arguably still more important than, than cover music. But there, there is a scene for cover bands, uh, which was not the case. And I mean, when I say here, I mean, New Hampshire, but, uh, Southern Connecticut really, when I was growing up, especially in the, you know, let's say late eighties, early nineties, when I was really playing a lot, the, the the cover scene just didn't exist at all. Whereas here it's probably let's say 50 50. And, and that's really hard to say. I mean, my my experience sort of informs my my perception, right? But um 
But, you know, so, but I'm with you. Like, I, I like this idea of being unique. Now, the question is, is it your song list that makes you unique or is it your ability to perform those songs that makes you unique, right? Like, well, the, it's yes. The answer is both of those things, right? But, but it, it can be more one than the other. There was a, um, uh, Adam Johnson, the, one of the co-hosts of Cover Me Confidential, um, was saying something. It was actually, he was uh, it was an article that he was in about his whole ATL party bands thing uh, that he put together. And it was an article, I guess, that came out right before we all started pandemicking. And uh, and so he reposted it recently since, you know, it really didn't have a whole lot of resonance when we're when we had this other stuff happening. But, right. um, you know, he said something in there where he approached his whole uh, like entrance into this or not entrance, but but participation in his scene from a standpoint of collaboration um, more than exclusion. But it didn't mean that he didn't want to be competitive. Obviously he wanted to be competitive, but the message really was to be open and referring, like you said, referring people to other bands and doing all the things that he could do. And yet his way of being competitive was making sure his band was fantastic or his bands. Cause he's got like a whole different, like that you could, you know, a zillion different permutations of, of, you know, pulling those people together. And, um, and I really kind of like that. That resonated with me. It's like, yeah, okay. You know what? If everybody out there is playing Mustang Sally and I realize that's a different thing than what you're talking about here, but it's like, okay, well you go play it the best you play it, you know, make it yours in a way that's still familiar to people and go and deliver it. And sometimes maybe you are delivering it straight. Like that song's not easy to play correctly. You know, we can, we can all hack through it. And and deliver enough so that everybody, you know, in the crowd dances and says, ride, Sally, ride. But to actually play it with that slippery groove like that takes a little bit of work, you know. And um, and so maybe that's your thing is really like digging in and making these songs work the right way for your band, as opposed to just being like a pickup band. And I, again, I don't mean to dismiss all pickup bands, but a pickup band where nobody really coordinates and it's like, okay, we're playing Mustang Sally. We're in C, right? Yep. We're in C. Okay, go. And there's no discussion about how the groove's going to work. It's just like, yeah, we'll play what we think we know the song to be and every, right. it won't matter. Right. And that like, that can entertain. Don't get me wrong. I've been on stage when that's happened and it's fine, but, but it's not, it's not the thing that's going to bring people back. So yeah. I think there's a lot of different ways of being unique and song list can be one of them, but but if you are all serving the same pool of people and and it is obvious that, you know, a song works for this pool of people, don't be surprised if somebody else picks it up. You know, like, I, I mean, we, in Fling, we started playing around with that um, that aha tune, the, uh, the take on mm -hmm. me. And nobody else was playing it around here. And we started playing it, you know, and it was like, OK, we can make this work for us. And then. You know, suddenly I went to see somebody else and it was like, they were playing. I was like, ah, look at that. Like we, we inspired this. And that's kind of how I saw it. It was like, Hey, that's pretty cool. Like that person's voice works for this. Like, that's great. I, and I guess I, 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 that never bothered me. Um, I, I don't know. It's cause it's, no, the I songs aren't ours. Like, you know, it's like you goop. Yep. And, that's I, the, and that's the counter argument. The songs aren't ours, but, but what, what I'm advocating for here is, What's healthy for a music scene? So clearly in many markets now, cover music is a scene, right? Like most most markets, you know, there, there are more cover bands playing now than, than before. And then we get into these kind of convoluted discussions about pay rates and, you know, and, you know, what's good and do we use iPads and all these types of things. And at the end of the day, we're coming to what is, what is the best and healthiest thing to make a scene vibrant. Yep. And if it's a bunch of people who are doing me too thinking, I can't think of any market, whether it's making software, making pizza, making music, that um, me too thinking is going to benefit a marketplace. You know, it's going to benefit the consumers and make things vibrant and exciting. See, I would I, argue uh, with that, though, because, uh, you know, you and I met because of, of one company's existence, and that's Apple, right? Now, yep. Apple... Very rarely in Apple's history have they ever been the first ones to market a product, a, a, a category of product, right? They, they were not the first with the personal computer. They were not the first with the smartphone. 
Uh, they were not the first with a tablet. They were not the first with a smart watch, right? Like all of these things were Apple saying me too. It, one way of looking at it is that Apple said me too, but I'm going to do it. I see what you've done. I see the problems. I see the friction points with what you've done and I'm going to do it better. So me too, but I'm going to do it better is essentially the description of the entire cover band scene. Right. It, it, because it's like that. That's what happens is you say, oh, I want to go play those songs, too, but I'm going to do it better. Right. And, and you I haven't think seen my fastball. You haven't seen my fastball. But but like some bands actually can deliver a fastball. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But not all of them. So I, I think I think that's where your un, your uniqueness is you and how you choose, not just what you, you know, like bring to the table in terms of your talent and maybe the gear you own, but. The although that can help with your light show and everything else, but also with the amount of work that you're willing to put in to make your show, and that encompasses a lot of things, unique. You know, you come to see, well, I can go see any band play Brown Eyed Girl, but that band, man, like they kill it. They've got these moves and they play the song, those harmonies and the lights, and you know, like, okay, now you're delivering. On all levels and, you know, and oh, then they sold me merch. And so now I'm wearing their name. So I have to go see that band. Right. Like there's a whole thing there. And I think that's where that's where you compete because you can't like nobody owns a song unless it's your song. I get it. Nobody owns a song. I would say this goes back to our argument, our conversation about ego, right? The number of bands who say you haven't seen my brown eyed girl, yeah. where it's really yeah. just another subpar brown eyed girl. That happens more. Well, you can take the Apple argument and I would say, who are the next three or four companies who thought they were as good as Apple that did things as well as Apple <laughs> yeah. that we can, that we can say succeeded. And, you know, so Apple, I would say is a bit of an outlier in that. Yes, they enter a market and they, and they kill, you know, at wherever they choose to enter. It's true. That's not the cover band scene. <laughs> uh, that's true. I, I, yeah. I mean, fair, not, not, but it, but it also is exactly the cover band scene, right? Cause the one band that can come in, and do all that stuff very well is going to succeed no matter who's no matter what songs they're playing. Right. And who else? Let me, let me say that differently. No matter who else is playing the same songs. All right. So I'll, I'll wrap this up nice and ni nice and tidy for you. <laughs> what I think is healthy in a thriving cover band scene is diversity. I, you know, I, there, I, there's room for tribute bands. There's room sure. for female led bands. There's room for male led bands. There's room for ethnic music. There's room, there's room for all. And what would make it interesting if you were, if you were a true music consumer and you wanted to, and then within that, you go out and you kill every night and then you earn an audience. And then, you know, you, you, you know, know that you can bring an audience wherever you're going to play in your local scene. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that the race for the best brown eyed girl is the most noble race, I guess. I, oh, I, I agree with you. And you're right. I mean, I don't think every band should be playing the same set list. I, I think bands should be playing the set list that fits that band the best, uh, regardless of who else is playing those same songs. And it might be, you know, I mean, a, a female fronted. Well, I was going to say a female fronted band playing Led Zeppelin. Like, that's actually really interesting because that's a twist on that thing. Right. Like, right. you know, and that's great. I, I think that's though. The, but they are doing what suits, you know, and when I say they, I'm thinking of a band like Led Zeppelin, right, where it's it's a female uh -huh. Led Zeppelin. They are doing a great job because they're doing something, perhaps not the only thing, but they're doing something that they can do well and and putting that out there. So should they be out playing, uh, you know, uh, Latin music all night? I don't know, but you know, it, it, it might not be, uh, the thing that they're good at. So, you know, better to do the Zeppelin thing. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. I hear you. Fun. I like these kinds so of So I got uh, two other things I want to share. One is, um, he, well, where I used to live in the, in the South Bay area, South San Francisco Bay area. We had where it's 90 amazing, degrees today. We're just going to point exactly, that out again. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But it's actually a little colder today because um, a woman who was probably the most well-known DJ in the area passed away yesterday. Oh, no. And I, so I just want to give a moment of love to Lori Roberts, who, who was with several radio stations in the South Bay area. She was that voice, you know, coming over your car radio or coming over your home stereo that, you know, you just disappeared and felt like 
rock and roll music was just kind of sifting into you and everybody like you's life back when DJs did that, you know, back mm-hmm. when the DJ was a, was a unifying experience. So Lori was amazing. She's a, a Bay area, um, uh, broadcasting hall of famer, amazing woman, big Bruce Springsteen fan. We had that in, in common. Um, and, uh, she was loved, respected and valued by so many. So I just rest in peace, Lori and to her family and on all who loved her. So, that's one thing. And then one last thing I just wanted to share is we've had a guest on the show. Who I really enjoyed the episode back when we were first getting started. Remember when we had the Coffus brothers on? I do remember when we had the Coffus brothers on. Yeah, they were great. So, yeah. So today's Jamie Coffus's birthday. I love Jamie. I still love that band so much and wish them so well. They continue to put out incredibly cool music and, you know, find their way in the world. Uh, I hope more success uh, lies ahead for them. Jamie is a soulful guy, wonderful piano player, great soulful singer, uh, just one of my favorite people that I've met in the Bay Area music scene. So happy birthday to Jamie. Hey, that's awesome. That's great. Very, very cool. Very cool. Happy birthday, Jamie. And yeah, rest in peace, Lori, and um, condolences to your family and friends. That's yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always good when there is a DJ like that, that you can really connect with. Like, that's a special thing, man. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's yeah. shapes, shapes many of our youth, you know, as, as you grow up when the radio was on all the time, kind of before streaming where you discovered music because you know DJs were playing what they wanted to play, you know, that we're going back a ways for that. But, um, you know, your, your experience of breaking music through the enthusiasm of a DJ who, you know, back then DJs, I, maybe they still do. I don't know, but you know, the, they loved the music so much and were very particular and, and uh, picky about what they would play. They, you know, fostered this vibe, you know, when listeners would call in, you felt, you felt like you were connected through yeah. music to a lot of people and to this DJ. And, you know, she was one of the best at it. That's great. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. They, that, that connection that, you know, these days we associate with podcasting, you know, because it's a personal connection. Mm. Um, really, it, you know, podcasting wasn't the first medium to do this. It really was those DJs, at least for me, same as what you're saying, where, you know, they like those DJs that, that taught you about music. That, that was Absolutely. like, that, that meant a lot. <laughs> yeah. It for really sure. did. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I remember the first time I met one of the, the local DJs that, um, that shaped me. I, I actually wound up going to his house to fix his computer and mm. it was just this bizarre experience. It was like, wow, I feel like I know you, but I know that I don't know you, you, you know, but also you've, you've shaped me like in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Like it was very bizarre. Um, but, uh, but I made sure to thank him. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It is cool. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's what we got. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening folks. If you have, uh, if you have something to share, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We, we really do love hearing from you. And I think we've actually got some questions that we just haven't gotten to because we've been, um, we've had so many things to talk about. There's been things happening, which is outstanding, <laughs> but you've had things happening too. So we will, we've got, um, we've actually got a guest coming up, not next week, but in two weeks, we have um, Brian Geller, who is a, um, well, he's the, the singer in a, in a tribute band called the Atomic Punks, uh, Van Halen tribute band. And he's also, uh, over there with ultimate ears where he's been for a long time. So he'll have lots of stuff to say, but in between this episode and that one, we have another one where, uh, we will answer some of your questions and get to some of these other things that we've been wanting to talk about too. So looking forward to it. You got anything else to say before we say goodbye, Paul? No, I said it all. Fun, fun episode today. Fun stuff. Yeah, for sure. All right, folks. Well, what is... Wait, there's got to be one more thing we say, Paul. What is that again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Always be performing. Performed very well, my friend.